Greetings and welcome to the Frank Silvera Writers Workshop New Play Reading Series. Special thanks to the Billy Holiday Theater for partnering with us to make this reading possible. Immediately following this reading, there'll be a moderated critique session where you can offer direct feedback about what you've just watched to the playwright. And now we're so pleased to present Faces in My Fist, written by Lisa McCree and directed by Sabora Rashid. Faces in My Fist by Lisa McCree. Levy Lee Simon, reading Harry Wills, African-American male in his 70s, still maintains hints of his boxer physique, yet he is physically slower. He is obsessed with the past that has worn him down from inside out. He never apologizes or says, I love you. He just handles his business. He is quite cynical and angry at the hand life had dealt him. Yahuda Carter, written for Kevin Johnson, 24 year old African American male from Mississippi. Kevin is a bundle of energy who wants to prove himself. Mm -hmm. He also has a unique perspective on the world. Kevin wants more than anything to become a boxer, trained by Harry Wills. Robbie Williams as Tony Gibson, 32 year old African American male who owns a stationary business. Tony is working through anger issues surrounding his father leaving him when he was a child. 1955, Harlem, New York. It's an old boxing gym, a boxing ring that is in disrepair. Washed out, dusty posters of old time boxers on the walls. Act one, at rise. Harry Wills enters a boxing gym. The place looks worn and faded with black and white posters of boxers from the 1910s up into the 1950s. The posters are worn and the edges curl up on the wall along with old washed out newspaper articles. There are pictures of Harry Wills with his manager. Other boxers hung in a cluttered fashion above a small desk. A tiny handheld radio with a small lamp on the desk. Harry enters. A boxing ring is staged left. It has a broken rope and a blanket and a pillow in the corner. A sign that says, colored, lays at Harry's feet. He bends down and picks it up, stares at it for a moment, takes a deep breath, then surveys the gym. He looks at the sign in his hand, then throws it into a pile of rubbish along the wall. He hears something scramble, and it startles him. Who's in here? I said, who's in here? You come out now, if I have to drag you out, I will show no mercy. Kevin Johnson stands with his hands up. Hello, sir. Who are you? Would you like I'm to Kevin. tell me what you're doing hiding on my property? I'm Kevin. Kevin Johnson, sir, like Jack Johnson, but no relation. That don't answer my question. What are you doing in here, boy? I'm sorry, sir. I had no idea this place still belonged to anybody. It's been empty for more than a month because that's just about as long as I've been here. I'm pleased to know it's a colored establishment. Why? You think because you're a Negro, I'm supposed to let you trespass on my property? No, no, sir. Sorry, sir. I, I was told this place closed long ago. I saw the color sign and I ripped it off the wall, thought it would be white on by now. May I shake your hand, sir? He grabs Harry's hand and begins to pump it vigorously. I believe a man can tell a lot about another man just by the way he shakes hands. See, Mr. Wills, I know everything about you. I know every fight you ever had. I know you fought Sam Langford 18 times and whipped him six. I studied you, read every paper. I was just a kid when you fought McVay. What do you want, boy? Uh, Mr. Wills, I've fallen on some bad luck back home. Miss Mississippi is my birthplace. So I come north find you. You know what they say, I, it's only three places a Negro can go, heaven, hell, or up north. 
which one of these places do you figure is the best place to be? I believe I've reached the best place, sir. But this place needs life. It's locked up tight like a museum. I, I shrine all these guys who are too old to fight now. No disrespect, sir, but this place is stuck in town. You break and enter, and then you tell me what to do with my gym. It's a place of peace. I don't think you want to wake up to sleeping giants. Well, sir, I've, I've come to find a trainer. I'm a real quick study. I train all the time. Uh, I think you think it's great you got spunk, boy. But there ain't no more fight left in these walls. Hey, Mr. Wills, give me a shot. A brick comes flying through the window. Glass shatters and Harry covers his face and Kevin ducks for cover. Shards of glass fall to the floor around them. Kevin jumps up and darts toward the front door. Hey, hey, don't go out there, boy. Are you crazy? Kevin runs out the front door. Harry goes to stand as if to try and stop Kevin. But before he can stand, Kevin appears in the doorway. Well, you got hard, but damn, if you ain't, if you, if any brains in that, in that head, they gone, Mr. Wells. Oh, well, that's a good thing, I guess. These cats round here don't scare me, sir. Yeah, I can see that. But let me give you some advice. If you are ever in the ring and you are just about to KO the biggest man you ever fought in your life and you thinking you get the got, got the best of him, that can all change in a split second. If he pulls a brick out of his shorts and lambs in upside your head, trust me, you're going down fast. Just close your eyes and go to sleep. Moral of the story is, don't fight with a brick, boy. Run. Okay. Okay. I can see you need something to do. I think we being cooped, I think being cooped up in here was dull your brain, your thinking. Harry pulls out a quarter. He tosses it to Kevin and Kevin catches. Run to the corner and get me that Amsterdam newspaper, boy. Harry begins to walk around his gym. Stepping over the shards of glass and the brick, he moves toward the desk and sees a frame that is so dusty, no one can tell beneath the glass is the first dollar he ever made. Harry takes it off the wall to take a look at it. White man puts a buck in your pocket and shakes your hand with no intention of letting you get near a step ahead. He stands in front of the Jack Dempsey poster. MC, you got away from me, but a time is gonna come when you are going to have to square up with me, and that might not be in this lifetime, and hell, they ain't but half full. Kevin re-enters. I got a Jet Magazine, too. I hope you don't mind. I owe you 15 cents. Kevin is thumbing through the Jet Magazine. You need some help? Maybe two seconds ago, yes. Not sure if your timing is off or if your intention is not to work. Harry climbs on the chair and looks out of the broken window. They showed him. My God. See how they showed him? For the whole world to see. You have to see this. Harry snatches the magazine. Aroused by Americans' first lynching in four years, a kidnapping and murder by three Mississippi white men, a chubby 14-year-old Chicagoan, Emmett Lewis Bobo Till, because he whistled at a white woman. Says here, at the mother's request, she wouldn't let the mortician retouch the face. Casket is gonna be left open for the whole world to witness the atrocity. Can they do that? She shouldn't leave the casket open, right? I was shut. Open your eyes to the truth, boy. Harry hands Kevin back his jet magazine and climbs down off the chair. Didn't you say you was from Mississippi, boy? Did you know Emmett Till? Can't say directly, sir, but I am sure I can, of course, pass at least once. It's a shame. Damn shame. Go home. Ain't nothing here. Go see that boy laid the rest. That's your real lesson in life. 
I'm not even sure I knew of him, sir. No matter. Go. Go see, go to see the truth for yourself. Go before they bury him and everyone forgets he existed. I don't need that kind of truth, sir. I believe my place is here. Not here, son. Not here. Harry turns to Jack Dempsey on the wall. He begins to peel up one corner, but the poster will not come down so easily. Why would you why would you want to take down Jack Dempsey? He punished Jess Williard in 1919, broke his nose, cheekbone, and knocked his teeth out. Oh man, did he earn the World Heavyweight Championship belt the hard way? I think Chicago has more truth at the cemetery than the people on these walls. This is no place for a boy to live. A gym may condition the body of a Negro, but the fight will leave his spirit broken and battered. You got to realize you will always be a nigger to them. They don't care who you beat. They will never give you that world belt. I beg your pardon, sir, but I don't want them to give me anything. I will take it like Jack Johnson did. I will, sir. I'm going to fight my way to the top of this white world and make it a black world. It will be a black world someday, sir. We will rule. Kevin takes a boxing stand. He punches the air, breathing quick breaths and grunting with each punch he throws against the air. I had those same dreams once too, boy. I thought I could change the world from the ring. But it's just fighting, boy. All you ever d gonna do is fight. You ain't gonna, you ain't never gonna wear the world championship belt. You got form, boy. But what you ain't got is a trainer. Get what you can, get what you came with, and go. I can't help you. I can send you to Chicago to see that dead boy. Go see the truth, and go back to Mississippi. Find. Find something to settle into and be at peace. Sounds like you're telling me to be a sick dog. Take my bone, bury it, and wait to die? Is that what you're telling me to do, sir? Locking this place up so tight so nobody else fit on the walls? I can't get there by myself, Mr. Wells. You are the greatest fighter I know. You got heart. You don't fear nothing. Nobody. You just didn't get to fight the white fighters that would have put you on top. I can be your protege. We can take that belt, Mr. Wells. Excuse me, do you know where I can find uh, Harry Wells? Who's looking for him? I am. Who are you? Are you Harry Wills? My business is with him. Well, say your business then. Tony hands Harry the paper he has in his hand. Kevin goes up to Harry to get a look at the paper also. I'm here to take ownership of my gem. What? Here's the original deed and my mother's will. I've been to see the lawyer. It's all legal. Since you never married her and the gem was in her name, well, she left everything to me. Maybe you remember her. Sarah? Sarah? Yes, that would be her. And I'm fulfilling her last request. One, she wanted me to meet you. Tony grabs Harry's hand and shakes it until Harry snatches it away. I am Tony Gibson, your son. Tony stops smiling and snatches his hand back. He takes out his little notebook and pen and makes a little check mark. Fulfilled. And two, if you look at these, it should be pretty self explanatory from there. This is my gem now. Oh, wow. Is that a good thing? Are, are you opening the place back up? Girl, yeah. what happened to Sarah? I would say she died of loneliness and betrayal, but she suffered from consumption in her lungs until they filled her with so much fluid it uh, choked her last breath. Oh, God, my Sarah. Yeah, she was very busy those last few weeks of her life, meeting with lawyers, writing in a will, gathering public records, and speaking to court clerks. Yeah. She told me about this place. 
she's pretty sure the place was empty since you are no longer a fighter. Huh. Yeah, I'm not sure why you're holding on to this place. Holding on to nothing. Oh, nevertheless, I will sell it. You can't do that. He can't do that. Can it do that, Mr. Wales? This place could thrive again. I could be the next great fighter to come from this gym. J.K. Johnson Jr. J.K. That's got a ring to it. Sarah, I hate she suffered. You look just like her. But I'm keeping my gym. So you're going to open back up, open it back up, Mr. Wales? You don't have four boxing stands that throws a flurry of punches in the air. You don't have much choice in the matter. Gibson, your mother gave you your, her maiden name. No, I changed my name when I was 18 to a worthy name. Kevin is bouncing around. Got that grunting, boy. What are you doing? Giving you back your papers. Why? Because you cannot have this place. Why not? You're not doing anything with it. I put the paperwork in Sarah's name long before you was born. Sarah was always good with paper and figuring that and that sort of stuff. Why would she believe I let this place go? No, it stays with me. It's, it's it stays with me. If it sits empty for the rest of my day, that's the way it'll sit. But you cannot have this place. Why? Nobody cares about what happened here. It was over 30 years ago. It's 1955. Rocky Marciano is a world's heavyweight champion now, and I'm here to tear down and build a parking lot. What are you saying? Yeah. What is, what is he saying? You can't park cars on top of the greatest man of, of boxing. Wouldn't that be sacrilege or something? Does not a son owe his father more respect? I owe you? A boy owes his father, yes. You are a crazy old man. Listen, son, I, I'm not going to... Look, I, don't call me son. You don't have that right. And if you think, I'm going to stand here and listen to you. You walked into this gym thinking that was your first mistake. Harry takes a boxing stance. Don't you see, boy? It's in that split second a man has to make a decision. Harry throws one punch, cutting the air in front of him. He can't plan and labor over what his next move will be. He throws another punch, an uppercut into the air. Kevin, standing nearby, begins to mimic. A white man tells you to take your time and think so he can get one step ahead of you to knock you back. You got to plant your feet and deliver the blow. You got to recognize the truth. You got to dig and dance the distance in that ring while you pummel that man standing in front of you. The truth ain't revealed until his shoulders will stand that 10 counts. Even then, you may not find your truth. You always question the dive. Yeah, the sermon would have been more useful when I was five. Harry stands up straight and looks at his son and sits back down. You didn't need it when you was five. I am ready, Mr. Wells. I'm, I am ready to fight. I won't think about anything. I'll fight anybody. Come here, boy. Go up to the third floor and see Ms. Alma. Tell her Will sent you. Tell her, to cook up, tell her to cook up my special plate and pile on the collars and the cabbage. Uh, I got company. Three plates, okay? Three plates, I okay? No, I have no intention of eating anything with you. I'm expecting my fiance on the four o'clock train. Tell her to send four plates. Kevin takes the money and exits. Have a seat. Have you been sleeping here? No. Listen, Harry, I'm not mad at you or anything like that. My mom wanted me to come. This is for her. That's it. No, Sarah. Look, she, she cried a lot. She cried a lot over you. She wasn't crying over me, boy. Your mama always cried at night, even when I was there. 
I guess it does something to a man when he can buckle the knees of his opponent, yet he can't comfort the woman clinging to you. You can't even say you loved her. My life changed when you were born, boy. And your mama, well, I stayed for as long as I could. Too much for you, huh? I worked as a longshoreman for a while, unloading, unloading cargo. You did that for me? Our jobs here and there. Yet you left? But my place is in the ring. I suspect I was born with my fist balled up, came in, came, come into this world fighting. What about us? Hmm? What about mom? Your mom was beautiful, boy. She looked like a little black china doll. Yeah, well, that was a long time ago. You didn't see her in her last days. Your mama was my world, boy. Nothing will ever change that. But I couldn't be around her. I had to fight all the time. <laughs> I stayed so jealous of anybody looking at her. I had to stay in the ring to, to keep from breaking rocks on the chain gang. Look, listen, I don't want to hear about this. I get it. You chose fighting over family. I chose who I was. I chose my dream. I didn't lie to you or your mom. The truth ain't pretty. Guess nobody showed you the, what truth looked like, so you imagine it the way you see it. Oh, so this is all my fault. My perspective is all wrong. Huh? I get it. Let me see if I can show you something. Eric gets up and finds the Jet magazine. He flips through the pages and then hands it to Tony. It took four days for them white men to find Emmett Till. Now, if you can imagine what they were thinking about, what they was plotting and planning the entire time, how they was hating that black boy all the while. Now, how is it what, how is what I do any different? I don't care about a man's color, age, or family. I got, I got paid to plot, plan, and annihilate my opponent. The ring is no place for sentiments, just rules and control. I can't control that man, but I can, I, but I, I can think it. I can punch him until I bring him down. I can wish him dead until the count of 10. No, there ain't no room to think of anything else. Seems different to me. I think you might be giving yourself too much credit, but hey, if you want to compare yourself to those white men, be my guest. Have you ever seen hate up close, boy? I know more about hate than you give me credit for. Your mama did what was right by you. A man's got to choose something in life and stick to it no matter what. Do you know I own a stationery store? Well, <laughs> how would you know? I figure you, uh, you could personalize some of my cards with your sentiments. Exactly what my sympathy line needs. Eloquent excuses, pitiful stories. <laughs> I'm a businessman, a real businessman. I did it all on my own. I didn't need you. I became a man on my own. How does that make you feel? The man who gave up being a father to live in a dusty old gym, still fighting a fight that was lost a long time ago. You don't know what you're talking about. I heard you took money to avoid fight Jack Dempsey. You didn't even dive. You just took the money. Another nigger bought and sold. Kevin is standing in the doorway with the bags of food from upstairs. Kevin drops the bags of food in the doorway and runs over to Harry. That's a lie. Huh? Ask him. Who told you that? Did, tell, did Sarah tell you that? Tell him the truth. Tell him he's a liar. John is not what you think. Why would... Why would you come in here with these accusations? No, you liar. You want to hurt him because he left you. Kevin. No, no, I don't, I don't need you to defend me. I can speak for myself. Whatever you want from this man, he can't give it to you. That's not true. He going to train me. I am going to be the greatest Negro fighter that ever was. You are in the wrong place. Ain't no champion ever step out this ring. I don't know what your mama told you about me, boy. I suggest you measure a man by your own ruler and not somebody else's. 
Harry stands there for a moment looking at Tony, then walks to the door and picks up the bags of food. He looks inside one bag. Damn! Harry looks at Tony for a moment. Tony glares at his father. Harry reaches into the bag and pulls out a paper plate that is wrapped in foil. All the food has slid to one side and is all mushed together. Harry removes the foil, grabs a plastic fork, and makes his way over to his son. He holds the plate in front of him. His son does not take the plate right away. His father's persistence never falters, and the son finally takes the plate. Harry goes back to the desk to get a plate for Kevin. Eat, son. Harry He's looks lying. Harry licks his finger and hands Kevin a plate, forcing him down in the chair to eat. Kevin sets the plate aside. He's lying, right, Mr. Wills? You didn't take the money, did you? He didn't even dive. Shut up. Did you take the money? Your guys got flaws. Shut up. Tell me. Tell him he's wrong. You can't erase what I know. Did you take a dive? You got to be in the ring to take a dive. Kevin stands with his fist clenched. No. Done. They bought his ass. That's not how it was. Yes or no? The fight ain't in the the fight ain't in the ring, boy. It's in the world. He is trying not to tell you he took the money. You can't fathom the madness. You think you know. You know nothing. Okay, tell him then. Tell him the truth. Well, you think you got choices in this world? The truth is, you got no choices. The white man is running this. They let you think you can choose. They let you think being good enough will get you through the door. That's the greatest lie, the greatest cover up. Niggas will never be free. My grandpa fought his, my grandpa bought his freedom and turned barren land into a thriving farm. He wanted no part of the white man. He didn't need them. That made him free. The excuses are written all over and in between. I only want to know the truth. The truth is in the casket, boy, and it will bury you. So it's true? Dempsey did not want to fight me. You settled on Furpo because Dempsey was putting you off. He wouldn't let you near him, so you couldn't secure the fight. I was near him. I shook his hand. I tried to... I the tried paper... To the paper said I didn't meet Dempsey. Those were your words. No, those were their words. My words were I don't ever expect to meet Dempsey in the ring. That is what I said. I knew Dempsey was kidding me along. I knew in my gut that man would never, never step foot in the ring with me. I fought harder than any other fighter to get in the ring with that man. I wanted him so bad I could taste it. The more I swung, the further away he got. So you couldn't have taken a dive? You never got in the ring? He took the money and ran. No way. No man gives up the shot for the world championship ever. <laughs> for 50 grand, they do. Ask they him. were not letting no Negro win the world championship. Jack Johnson did. They won it. He won it without question. Winning it without question ain't the issue, boy. You can't step in the ring and whip on a white man, even if you is calling him Mr. All the while you pummeling blood from his face without great cause to the Negro. We swung on trees. Our skulls separated from our spines because a nigga made it to the top of the white world. I thought he was, he thought he was on top, but they wrecked him in any way they could. He thought he could outrun the hate and he died fleeing. So why fight if we can't be on top, if it's killing our- 50 grand, 50 grand, I'd fight too. <laughs> War is in the fab in a man's fabric, fighting no, in the Maybe it's the world we live in and the white man has got his foot so on a Negro's neck, the only place a Negro can choke the hell out of a white man legally is in the ring. Maybe for every blow, every broken nose, every humiliation of a white man at the hands of a Negro is justice. So why take the money? 
I had no choice. You gave up. <sighs> they paid him too much. He didn't have to get dirty, just got ink on his fingers. Your fight is with me, boy. Don't you squash his dreams. You're not his dream. I don't believe this. There's nothing I could have done. I'm telling you, boy, nothing. You are the worst kind of liar. I was robbed of the world championship. Open your eyes, boy. You always ugly in the world. You protect your lies in this place. That's why you won't change it. You need, you need it to stay the same. You need it stuck in time. Go find yourself a real trainer. I can't believe you're a liar. I did not lie to you. What did you ask me? What answer did I give that was misleading or untrue? I told you to go see firsthand the ugly in this world. I wanted you to see it for yourself, not through my eyes. I wanted to prepare you to harden your heart so it would not lead astray from your battles. I am asking you, but you, but you can't see no answer me solidly. Did you take the money? Tell them. Don't lie. Go ahead. Tell them. Yes! Damn it, yes! Kevin flies into a rage. He goes to the wall of boxing greats and begins to punch and kick the wall. I was robbed. They was never going to let J Dempsey at me. They was never going to let me at Dempsey. Never. You're a liar, a fake. Everything you ever done has been a lie. Oh, that's not true. Harry hustles over to Kevin and grabs him, holding him tight, not allowing him to hit the wall. Get off! Let me go! He's a coward. Kevin is trying to break free from Harry, but Harry holds him tight and is almost knocked off balance by Kevin's wildness. Is this who you are? Your hate is not for me, son. Your hate, you, you hate the world. I am who I've always been. I wasn't there for you, but you better, you better off without me in your life. Get off me. You hate me so much you want to destroy this boy's dream. Harry spins Kevin around in his arms and slams him against the wall. Stop! He looks down at Kevin's knuckles, which are bleeding. Control, boy. Harness it. Use it. Damage the opponent, never the weapon. Harry takes Kevin Riss and shakes his hands high in the air as a boxer who won fights would have had his hands raised in the air. Kevin snatches his hands away. Teach him. Teach him how to be a cowardly nigga. Harry spins around so fast that Kevin coils back for a moment. Harry does not rush. But with fierce intention, he walks towards his son. Tony, who has been toying with his plate of food, places it on the floor, floor and stands although he is angry. He is also afraid. Harry walks to the ring, snatches the blanket from the ring floor, and throws it aside. He walks around until he can reach the pillow and throws that out of the ring. He grabs the broken rope and flings it outside of the candle. He walks straight to his son's face and puts his finger right on Tony's nose. Get your hands up, me. Tony moves his head to the side to remove Harry's finger, but he will not touch Harry's hand. Harry again moves his finger to his son's nose. Tony backs his head up. Do you want to know what you missed? Do you think you missed out on what I would have taught you? Well, this is what I would have taught you. Get your ass in the ring. First lesson, I'm going to bring you to the root of the word nigger. I want to educate you so that the next time someone calls you a nigger, you will wipe it from their vocabulary forever. I didn't mean it that way. Ain't only one way to mean it, son. You wanted me in your life. You feel as though you miss out on having a father. I'm here. Tony backs I away from Harry. Harry turns to Kevin. Let me see those hands, boy. 
Harry sits on a crate and takes Kevin's hand. Mr. Patty was my manager for 17 years. The man was like a father to me. I remember he tried to get me to go to another manager, one who could secure me a fight with Dempsey. But I was loyal, I was his favorite. I never needed to sign no papers with him either. His word was a law. I remember old Mr. Patty called Dempsey out. He called him yellow. <laughs> and he said he was afraid to fight a colored man. <laughs> he was supposed to fight three fights to get to Dempsey. Oh, that was a condition. Yes, but they were stalling. It was hell trying to get those fights lined up. I was, it was like the whole world knew what I wanted, but they was on Dempsey's side. They played the waiting game for six years. That's when you fought Furpo. Yes, I went head to head with Furpo. Took you 11 rounds. 12, it was a draw. Everybody knows I won that fight. Their decision was by design to keep me further from Dempsey. I just got tired waiting, tired of being twice as good with, with the odds stacked against me. <laughs> yeah, I'm old now. I just want to keep my memories and live in peace. Memories? What memories? Your skew recollections that you your rightful place was world heavyweight champion? You're the victim? Nobody will ever remember you as a champion. You will always be the man who took the money and ran. I have to go back now. I have to scrutinize. I have to question play by play, punch for punch. 32 victories by knockdown. Was it really? I have to check the connection. What was the combination? Was it too easy? Did sweat fly? Or was his mouth wide open as he ate the mat? Mr. Patty did everything in his power to get me a fight with him. So. Look, I will just sell this place and be done with it. A parking lot is proper. Sell it to me. I can make it into a place for real champions. Harry has finished wrapping both of Kevin's hands. He places Kevin's hands, Kevin's hands in Kevin's lap and pats them. Unless you plan on changing your career to a stevedore, <laughs> I would refrain from hitting brick walls. Leave me alone. You boys think y'all know everything about being a man. You both are still wet behind the ears. You had your mama protecting you, absorb, uh, absorbing all the hate in the world until it ate her up from the inside out. And you, hiding in another man's memory where it's safe, you can punch these walls to your, to your fist break. Have enough people riding my back to last me a lifetime. You think your hands hurt now? This is nothing. Harry grabs Kevin's hand straight on the bandage and Kevin flinches from pain. This world will chop your chop off your head, shove it down your throat, and don't care how it makes your food taste. Look, I'm not afraid of you. He might be scared of you, but I ain't. Why did you take the money? It was my purse. I earned it. Whether I stepped into the ring or not, I showed he didn't. Nothing worse than a broke fool standing on principle. Refuse $50,000 and do what? Stand on the bread line with my pride for what? For me, your son. To prove what? That you love me. Is this what this is about? <laughs> me loving you? <laughs> you never made sacrifices for me. <laughs> we all make sacrifices, boy. Mom made all the sacrifices. You don't know what I did for you. You saw your mother making sacrifices, but that don't mean wasn't nobody in the back pulling the strings and keep you two afloat. How do I can become boxing now? Everything I believe, trusted, and want to be like is built on lies. Maybe I'll go back to Mississippi, find a trainer, and like you say, make my memories. Look, I don't know why I came. I, I should have just sent my lawyer to settle the details. It's Nothing here for me. Tony approaches Harry, but not so very close. He leans in a bit towards his father. I hope you have a good life, old man. 
I hope every time you see my mom's face, it haunts you. I'll make way more than 50 grand. And just for the record, Jack Dempsey would have kicked your ass. Suddenly, he grabs Tony by the neck and chokes him with both hands. I would have killed him. I would have. I was trained, conditioned, focused. I slept with anger. I got to know. I got to know her well. She was my mistress. You don't know what it is to want to kill a man. I fought to get him. I fought to get him, and he dismissed me. Everything I trained for, he dismissed me. I was nothing to him. Let him let go, Mr. Wells. Let go. I jumped about this man sitting at my table, taking food from my mouth and laughing at me. He 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 whipped me until my 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 blood bled. Then he spit between my open wounds. I have never felt such hate for a man. You tell him, Mister. Ain't, ain't you got no? Ain't you? You ain't got to face injustice from no white man to want to murder somebody in cold blood. Rage, boy. Feel. Feel like you've been robbed, wrong. Feel caged, boy. Death be the only freedom. And if you think that man would have whipped me in the ring that my blood paid for, then you ain't you ain't met anger, boy. You best fall on your knees and thank your Almighty God that you worship on Sunday that I left, saved you from catching my hate. Cause the ring is the only thing that saved me. I could have pummeled that man. And I will pummel anybody who says differently. Stop, Mr. Wales, please. Is the, is the world ugly enough for you now, boy? Speak up, boy. I can't hear your hate. I know you got it in you because I sold my I sold it in my seed. Passed it to you, even though I stayed, stayed far away. Spit it out, boy. Harry pulls Tony's face close to his ear. Tony is choking to death. Then as if he realizes what he's doing, Harry lets go and Tony's knees buckle and he falls to the Oh my God. Oh my God, son. son. Harry holds his fist up in front of his face, looking at them in horror. Blackout, end of act one.
Act two, at rise, Kevin is sitting Indian style in the middle of the ring. Harry is sitting seated on the edge of the ring. I don't know if, if there is a way to become a different kind of boxer. What do you mean, boy? Like, is there a way to enjoy it, but not get swallowed up in hate? Uh, I guess it's like being a slave and not wanting to escape. They go hand in hand. One ain't possible without the other. If you're a slave, if you don't want to be free, if you don't want to flee, then it ain't slavery, I guess. Boxing ain't boxing without some sort of hate. But isn't it a competition of the fittest? Don't be no fool, boy. You ain't wearing no flat sandals and metal skirts racing chariots to please the gods. That was competition. This is survival. You a Negro colored man 90 years off the plantation and not a damn thing has changed. No matter what they say. Harry reaches on the chair for the Jet magazine. He flings it over to Kevin. You ain't got the stomach for it. Give it up now. Do you think he'll come back? What do you think? You try and kill me. I ain't coming back. Lost my head. Wasn't right, I know. What makes father so mad he would try and kill his son? I wasn't trying to kill him. I was just... You wasn't. were. You were. Your view of the world ain't the law, you know? You ain't got to listen to me. Hell, I didn't come looking for you. I know. Won't hurt you to get a little wisdom. You say Jack Johnson was a bad thing because black people got lynched when he won. But if he didn't fight, you wouldn't have been able to get in the ring. When doors are broken down, people are bound to get smashed. But if it was you, and you had the chance to be on top of the world, would you still fight knowing it was killing your own people? Yes. Why? I didn't start boxing to make no kind of statement. I was born to fight. It's just who I am. Some people get backed into greatness. Others thrive for it, but never find it. What you got to realize is fighting prejudices is always going to leave casualties behind. It's designed that way. I didn't make the rules. I just played the game. He's still whipping you, you know. What are you saying, boy? You ain't that fast, Mr. Wells. And I ain't fool enough to breathe down your throat while talking smack to your face. What you mean to say, boy? Can't you, can't you see, Mr. Wells? You was outmaneuvered. Dempsey whipped you. He didn't have to spar, pivot, sweat, or throw a single left or right hook. All the while, he was wanting Dempsey in the ring, studying his moves, getting his rhythm down, smelling his stench. He was studying you too. He knew you wanted to kill him, that you dreamed about the day. You could dominate him, beat him down, and take his belt. He knew you wanted to embarrass him in front of the world, but what you didn't count on was he was studying you too. He had his strategy. I mean, it was smart. I give the guy credit for flanking and not being a grunt who rushes out on the front line just to die first. Dempsey did nothing. Never answered a question for you. He let you do the deed for him. Look at you. You whip yourself every day. He's probably somewhere eating steak and laughing, having a good old time. And you're here, swallowing a poison pill every morning with your coffee. You're, you are withering from the inside out. You can't even pass along the knowledge you got. What are you going to give a kid like me? You're so busy trying to get me to see Emmett Till, his funeral. What about yours? What are you trying to show me? What is it you don't want me to see? I may be some kind of back. I, I may be from the backwoods of Mississippi. 
but I ain't dumb. I see you, Mr. Wells. Harry stands in front of the Dempsey poster. Black Panther versus Black Kid Blackie. Kid Black, you played me like the big stack at the poker table. You protected, I went in. You danced me around the ring, wore me out, then descended and put a whooping on me. You son of a... Yeah, you outsmarted me. Harry gets a burst of energy and rips at the Dempsey poster, ripping it in half. He throws the half in his hands to the floor. Kevin runs and gets Mr. Wills a chair. It's okay, Mr. Wills. It's over. Let it go. You can never win them all, Mr. Wills. I'm okay, boy. My grandpa knows Moses Rat. Who? Moses Rat. Emmett Till's uncle. Yeah. I know I said before they may have crossed paths, but... It's all right, son. Do you know why I'm telling you this? Why? As you said, what those men did, Emmett Till, represents the ugly in the world. But I don't see it that way huh, at all. Moses Till is a preacher, so isn't that kind of like being God in a way? then Emmett would be like Jesus, right? I mean, the fact that he was crucified and everything. So in the Bible, doesn't it talk about the people who gathered to see Jesus die on the cross? So I figure all of the people going to see Emmett, they are like the chosen ones. Maybe they touch Emmett's garment and he changed too because Jesus ain't here right now. I know it sounds dumb. But my grandma believes God is in all of us. So it sort of makes sense that by going to the funeral and seeing Emmett's face like that is like seeing Jesus with thorns in his head. Maybe his face holds peace and love despite what they did to him. Maybe he wants us to get beyond the hate. Maybe all of this is to teach us something. Don't ever stop worshiping God in heaven, boy. Oh, I won't. Are you going back to Mississippi? I don't know. I don't know where to go. Are you running from the law or something, boy? Not so much law, but I am running. Where you running from? People is looking for me. People like who? Out there is Papa for one. <laughs> he done got a gal in trouble. <laughs> I love Althea. I really do. She has been my girl for two years. So? So? Looking down the barrel of her papa shotgun with Althea holding her belly and begging me to work in the textile plant wasn't exactly how I pictured my future. And what are you going to do? I'm going to marry her. I am. I was scared. So I ran. I mean, anybody would be scared hearing something like that. Problem is, I hid out for a spell. Then Mudcat came to see me and told me her family sent her up north. She got kinfolk up here. I will find her, Mr. Wills. Can't be that hard find a girl from Mississippi seeing, seeing she stick out like a thumb. I thought you came here to box, boy. I did. That's all I ever wanted. I was training in Mississippi. My friend, trekking, Mudcat always be in the backwoods training with me. Mudcat is the biggest guy you ever want to see. I knocked him out twice. He had a mouthful of Mississippi dirt both times. I'm 24. That ain't so young. I just need to get started so I can find out there. I got to have something so I can take care of. Boxing ain't no job where you, get, where you figure a paycheck. It takes training. It could take years. It's got to be your life. You got to commit. I am committed, Mr. Wells. What's wrong with you, boy? I'm hungry. Get some food in that bag over there. It's cold, Mr. Wells. 
Well, next time a man buys you dinner, make sure you eat it while it's hot. No telling when, when no telling when he might feed you again. Mm. Mm. And cold cabbage will put a whipping on you, boy, worse than any man in the ring. Have you feet tiled up like a baby, crying for the Lord to take you out? Take it to Miss Alma. Ask her to warm it up for you. Let her know I'd be greatly obliged. Kevin takes the plate and the bag and heads towards the door. Harry goes over to the torn poster of Dempsey. I knew I'd give you everything for the chance to win the world. You knew I'd give you everything for the chance to win the world belt. How did you know? Who did your, think who did your thinking for you? The KO beyond the 10 counts? Who took away your inner beast? Took away the war within you so you could give up without a fight? Why did you not want to prove and know for yourself that you could just decimate me? Your world let you hold fast to the lie. How could you live with a title you didn't even earn? What kind of man were you? Maybe as much as I, as much, uh, maybe far as much as I studied you, I missed everything. I studied in preparation for the ring. I didn't study your world. So you got me. Technicality, default, nudging the score. In a split second decision, I could choose to lower my gloves and it will all be gone. The win, the losses. But how do I slay the monster inside me? Answer that. Tony is standing in the doorway. Harry is startled. Son, you came back. Harry looks past Tony to see if there's anyone with him. Come in. Tony hesitates. Uh, I'm, I was trying to tidy up a bit. Maybe the boy was right. I, I keep this place locked up like a museum. What if I train the boy? At least until he finds somebody else. You know, teach him the business. The ugly side. He's a good boy. He's been teaching me a, a thing or two. Y'all boys ain't let the old man off the ropes all day. Only inches inside. Look, I just came to let you know that I'm leaving tonight. I will no longer have any contact with you about the sale of the property. I, I suggest you get all your stuff off these walls and you uh, take it with you. Sit down, sir. Sit, sit, sit for a minute. There's nothing to discuss. Let me just bend your ear for, for a minute, sir. One minute. If Sarah was alive, she'd have me in the ring. <laughs> so much of her could beat me down. She was small, but she could hold her own. All right, minutes up. I know you think you missed out on, son. Maybe on some level you did. Son, I can assure you, you were better off without me here, without me there. I was on a mission and nothing was going to stand in my way. I couldn't, I couldn't let it. I wasn't important enough? Son, it wasn't you. I knew you were in good hands with your mama. Sarah would have boxed Dempsey herself to protect you. She had, she had fight in her too. <laughs> that, that's why I chose her. I sent Sarah money from every purse to make sure you were taken care of. My first fight was with George Kid Cotton in 1911. He wasn't no big fighter, but, but Kid Cotton delivered an unbelievable right-left combination. I went down days. I struggled to recover, but my legs went rubber. I began to talk to God at that very moment. If he couldn't restore stability in my legs to rise from that mat, I would do it myself. I vowed to never let a man get the best of me again. Something I left, something I left me when, when the, Something I left when the ref got those 10 counts. I felt it. I was like an unburdening almost. It was like an unburdening almost. I can't quite describe it, but I know nothing leaves without being replaced by something else. I was focused. I trained. I ate right, kept my weight, my body condition, my heart dictated to my body, and I could do, only have one thing fueling me, the desire to win. Hate, anger, destruction moved in my body. I let it reside. I fed it. I fueled it. 
the only of the battle. Saw my opponent on the mat, never able to rise. I had to see it in my head. That was the only way, boy. Do you, do you understand? I hated you for leaving me. I felt like it was my fault, like as a son. Nah, I failed you. Uh, don't ever, don't, don't you never blame no man for who you are and never let no man take credit for who you become. You let that white man have your life, our life, and it's gone now. Doesn't that mean anything to you? <laughs> so funny. Oh, I'm not laughing, boy. I was thinking about your mama. I remember when she first told me about you. I would box your stomach so gently. I was hoping for a boy, you know. I wanted you to come out like me, fist clenched, knocking a hole in the world. You were my reason for fighting. But it gets lost, boy. Can you understand that? Can you understand how a burning in your stomach gets diluted? <laughs> like taking an aspirin for a stomach ache, it don't take the ache away. It just makes it so you forget it for a while. You were the pain in my stomach, boy. My reason for fighting. The longer I was away, the more diluted you got. She tried to make me not hate you. She would talk endlessly about you. Your fights, read me your articles. When I was seven, I wanted to be just like you. I wanted to box. Thought I'd get a chance to fight you in the ring. Then after I beat you, only then would I tell you I was your son. As the ref was holding my arm over my head in victory. Mama wasn't having none of that. Go to school. Don't be like your papa. Be your own man. I thought you would show up when I graduated high school. But you didn't. What father does not show up to his son's graduation? Uh, I can't go back. I don't want you to. Just tell me how you would like me to handle the sell of the property. How much time do you think you'll need? Son, I can't let you sell this place. You don't have a choice. I'm holding on, son. Are you really going to fight me on this? It's all I got. There you go. What? Choosing everything but me. I don't know what you want from me. I have built a life. This is all I know. You don't want to know me? Sure I do. No, you don't. You want to punish me for decisions I made long ago? You got to let go. You can't hold You can't keep holding on, son. Huh. The pot calling the kettle black. I know I got to let go too, but I got to settle some things in my mind first. I imagined you so differently. Never meet your hero, that's what they say. You're not my hero. Don't have to be. But long as you got one, I guess that's all that matters. Tony walks around the gym to the walk to the posters on the wall. These men mean more to you than I do. You keep trying to compare yourself and fit into a life that has nothing to do with you. You are trying to compete. Isn't that all you know? Competition? Win, lose, draw, knockdown. Why should the rules change for me? There's nothing to change. The rules that just don't apply to you, son. Tony Step stops in front of the John Dempsey poster. You blame him, don't you? Tony. Tell the truth. I have told you the truth. No, you haven't. What do you want to know, Tony? Ah, uh, it's Tony now, not boy. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? You going to strangle me again? I never meant to. I want to know why you can't let this go. Why does this Dempsey have this power over you after all of this time? Kevin enters with his plate of food and walks over to the ring and sits down. It's easier to blame it on one man. Of course, it was bigger than that. I can't strike out against the world and bring it to its knees. I could focus on Dempsey. But Dempsey wasn't the one who refused to fight. What? 
you know. It was in 19 and 22. Dempsey and I met. We both signed the contract. But Muldoon would not allow the fight. Muldoon? Who is he? New York's commissioner at the time. He refused to let the fight happen in New York. He wouldn't chance a Negro becoming world champion in his city. It would have burnt New York to the ground. What? Ricard began raising ticket prices to two bucks a seat, outpriced the working class so no one could afford to come. They were either going to make it the richest payday any promoter had ever seen or make it impossible for me to fight. After that, they stalled and gave me the runaround until my contract ran out. I sued the New York Boxing Commission. But you see, but you see what good it did. So, was the money from the lawsuit? It was a consolation. In my eyes, an unearned purse. Their way to get me, their way to get me to go away. It was more important to make the situation disappear rather than shoveling coal into a fire that was already too hot. For six years, I wanted to fight that man. Unbelievable. You've been carrying hate for a man all these years and it wasn't even him? What was I to do? There's only room for one man to step in the ring with me. Give it to whoever deserves it. It ain't something you can understand so simply. It's woven into the fabric. It's hate. It's 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 more than anything. It's it's more than whatever. Yep, listen, blame who was responsible. You want me to feel sorry for you? Well, I don't. Isn't injustice based on the color of a man's skin enough, boy? Sure, it's plenty. But we all caught up in a time of prejudice and hate, but there are people who are trying to end segregation, and it may not be in your lifetime, but you are so stuck you can't even see the small changes. Ain't much change in Mississippi. But your hardship is no more devastating than mine. Or the colored man next door who can't feed his family. Why you get to be different? Why should you be entitled to world championship because of your pain? I think we should keep things separate but equal. Negroes just need to stick together. If white people don't want us, why are we trying to be in their world anyway? Just because the law says integrate hell. Opening the door to make it easy for them to lynch us, that's stupid. But look what we do to our own kind. Tony, man, I don't get you. What? You ain't let up on Mr. Will since you got here. You walk in here talking like a white man, handing over papers, talking about you going to make this place a parking lot. This is history here, our history. You can't just tear it down. He built this, you didn't. If you hate this man so much, why are you still here trying to take what's his? Leave, you ain't got to stay here. Go try and tear up the white man's place, see how far you get. Mind your business. This is my father, not yours. I wish he was. No, you don't. Don't talk for me. He would have left you too. He was never there for me. My pops died before I was born. But if I had a chance to talk to him just once, I wouldn't be a sissy crying over him leaving. This doesn't concern you. Your jaw has been poked out further ever since you got back from the train station. Where's your girl? She's late. Huh. Nobody late for a no-show. She'll be here. And why are you worried about me? Hell, you you sleeping in here. I won't be for long. I'm going to buy myself a mansion with all the money I make from beating live my chaps like you. Well, why don't you go back to Mississippi? You can go ahead over there and pick some old cotton or chuck some old corn. Whatever y'all do in them backwoods. From what I saw earlier, Mr. Wills can handle himself. But any time you want to graduate from... A strangling to a Mississippi backwoods real ass weapon. Just let me know. <laughs> you can swell your chest all you want. You gonna need more than that with me, Chuck. Okay, okay. Where, where is your gal at, boy? Why wasn't she at the station? She'll be here. Huh. 
<laughs> that does it. Look, I'm leaving. I hate she didn't show. Yeah, I was going to ask her to marry me. She dodged the bullet. Yo, your mama left me plenty before I was you before you was born. Always came back. She never told me that. Oh yeah, I remember. I, I remember me and your mama was out in this club one night. Guess you were about a year or so. It was two days before my fight with old Fast Fist Freddy. Yeah, uh, did me and your mama have a good old time? <laughs> Man, could she dance? I wanted to stay on the dance floor with her, her the whole night, but your mama felt it was best to circulate. That's what she used to like to call it, circulating. Well, I was tired and ready to go, but your mama was talking to everybody, and I couldn't get her out of the club. Next thing I see, old Fast Fish Freddy making his way over, staggering loud and talking about how he was going to whip me, whip me in the fight come Saturday. He walks up to your mama and bumps her. Spills his drink up and down the front of her dress. I was two seconds from walking away. The mark of a man is what he does in the split second he has to process the situation. So I look over at your mom and she grinning like a shisha cat and, and tells him she is sorry. Then he takes out his handkerchief and starts dabbing the front of her dress. She, she saw it coming. Saw it in my eyes. She screamed, Harry, no. And as she shot behind me, I drew back to lay that Negro out and got a pain in my elbow. I turned around and your mama laid out on the floor and her two front teeth are stuck in my elbow. <laughs> what? You hit my mom? <laughs> I couldn't believe my China dog lying there like that. What are you laughing at? <laughs> two, two teeth and elbow. <laughs> it wasn't my intention. I, would, I wouldn't hurt your mama for nothing in the world. But a part of me did feel a sense of relief seeing her lying there looking all pitiful and mess, missing her two front teeth. Because what nobody look at her to, couldn't. Because nobody would look at her the same. Ah, I could live with her like that. <laughs> but your mama was headstrong. She got her teeth fixed and I hit the road. Had to. Well, I had to kill somebody. You think that's funny? Don't you get it? Her two front teeth sticking out of Mr. Will's elbow? I don't know. I don't know how you can't see the humor in it. Yeah, well, how about I knock that grin off of your face? Whatever you say. Mr. Stationary Man, what are you going to do, ma'am and hateful postcards? Turn it both to the ring. No. Do you, do you spray perfume on your sister letters, pretty boy? Tony. You, you suck a pansy ass, pretty boy. Yeah, he that's right. Kevin to the canvas. He then begins to dance in the ring, egging Kevin on. Yeah, that's right. Mississippi boy laughing my mama now. I can't hear you. Kevin regains his footing and charges Tony, grabbing his thighs and lifting him off his feet and landing him on his back. The two boys scramble to gain control. Harry is trying his best to step into the ring. You punk. I'll kill you. You're weak. You hit a man when he's not looking? What man taught you that? Oh, that's right. You was raised by a woman. You used to cat scratch fighting. Kevin, I'm going to teach you how to fight like a real man. Teach you what I learned in backwoods in Mississippi. Kevin raises up and punches Tony across his face. He swings again just as Harry is up in the ring and grabs his collar. Excuse me. Excuse me. And punches Tony in the nose. Blood spurts everywhere. Harry pulls Kevin back with such force he almost falls out of the ring backwards over the broken rope. Tony scrambles to his feet and tries to kick Kevin, but he loses his balance. All three men are on the canvas. Harry reaches and grabs Tony. He pulls him close, hugging both boys close to him. You feel it now, don't you, boy? Cursing through your veins like lava, burning a hole right through your skin, leaving a gaping hole for all sorts of things to hide and fester. Call a name, boy. Say a name. You're going to call my name before it's over. Call a name, boy. Ruby. No, oh, her name ain't as pretty as that boy. Her name is ugly, filled with rage and hate. Call her name. 
My name is JK. Say my name. Her name is Anger Boy. You can call her pain. You can call her hate. She is the only woman who can help you survive the darkness. <sighs> you ain't got to make it with you can't make it. You ain't gonna make it without her. Learn how to control, control her, boy. Learn how to respect her. Learn when when you got to unleash her. Never let her rule. She can destroy you too. He draws his son tight to him. He lets Kevin go and gently pushes him away. Harry signals Kevin to take down a box from a high shelf over the desk. I got something for you, boy. Harry slides the extremely dusty box closer. He balances himself, keeping his son close and in front of him. Tony melts into his father's arms like a child. Harry carefully pulls back the tissue paper inside and exposes its contents. Kevin leans in to see. First time I wore these was in the ring with Charlie Weinert. Yeah, you leaned in hard on that man. Never gave him a moment to execute a single combination. Then you KO'd him in the second round. And not worn it out so badly, his feet stayed in the air for a full seven seconds. Harry takes the boxing, boxing gloves out of the box. He holds them up for Tony to see. He places one glove in Tony's lap and points out something to him. Do you see that, son? Tony takes the glove and really examines it. He looks very hard at the glove and then up at his dad. That's you. That's me? Yes. You did this? I had him done specially. They custom made Mildred, a seamstress I knew, stitched everything by hand. Looks like you, and that there looks like your mama. Tony picks up the other gloves and looks at it. That's mom. Yes. Can I see that? Kevin moves in closer and looks at the detailed work. Oh. Your face and your mama's face in my fist. Give me the motivation to step in that ring and finish the job. Kevin snatches the glove from, gloves from Tony. Oh, man. Dig it. Let's see. Let's say you and I get the dust off with these. Kevin claps the gloves together. Give me those. What are you going to do? Send me a postcard requesting them back? Or are you going to take them, son? Tony lunges forward and Kevin dodges him with fancy footwork. Put them up, paper boy. You're not worthy of my time. You're not worthy of my time. Well, Lynn, let's make it worth your time. Kevin snatches Tony's paperwork from the for the gym out of Tony's back pocket. Does this make it worth your while? Give me those. Kevin makes a motion as if to rip them up. Tony scrambles to get the paper. Kevin keeps them out of Tony's reach. Don't. I tell you what. You beat me, you get them back. No, 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 no. I got one even better. The gloves in the gym. You beat me. You can park all the fancy cars you want all over the top of this place. You lose, Mr. Wills keeps his gym, and I get the glove. Wait, wait. Come on, Mr. Wills. Don't rip that. It's the original deed. Fight me for it. Wait, just wait. Unless you don't believe your son got it in him to win. Give me back the papers, boy. I'm his Dempsey, Mr. Wills. He will relive this moment over and over for the rest of his life. It's like you said, Mr. Wills, the decision a man makes in that split second determines his character. This is my gym. Not anymore. It could still be your gym, Mr. Wills. Uh, what? You going to make decisions all over the top of my head, boy? You win. It's your gym. Parking lot. And I will park your cars for you. But you got to beat me. I could whip you. Oh, so is that a yes? No. What? You don't believe I can beat him? Pushing papers ain't boxing, boy. You think I don't have it in me? Nope. Harry. Pop? Harry turns to Tony. He looks at his son for a moment. Mr. Wills. Harry turns and looks at Kevin for a moment. Harry bows his head. It seems as if he's going to crumple. He folds into himself. Something is pulling from deep within him. 
take time to wake up, you sleeping giants. Woo! We got our first spot. The champion is coming out of here tonight. I told you. I told you. Don't get ahead of yourself, jungle boy. JK to you, son. I'm going to show you what comes from the backwoods of Mississippi. Uh-huh. Yeah, you don't know me. You don't know nothing about me. I got Will's blood all up in me. I'll bury you, boy. Wake him up! Yes! Let's see how much of your daddy's blood is really pumping in them veins. I don't believe you got any of his blood in you. I say you got all your mama's blood. Female cat blood. Meow! No cat scratching, punk. Are you sure you won't find out? It's going to be a showdown at the holdown. JK. 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 Let me take those hands, sir. Yeah. We don't want to break those pretty little fingers. You might not be able to stick stamps on them fancy little postcards. Don't, don't sit on the edge of the stage as Harry readies himself to take his, his son's hand. This is it. That split second in which you have to make a decision, son. You got my blood in you. That counts for something. Remember to balance and don't keep your feet too wide. Don't get square. Then stay small. Harry is wrapping his son's wrists and hands in tape as he teaches him. No kicking, scratching, biting, or windmill. Focus, boy. Talk to her. Get control. Calm down so you can hear me. What's her name? Anger. Who is she working with? Tony Wills. The heart and the head, son. The heart and the head. You have to think in it. She will drive you, send you into a maddening state, and betray you if you let her control you. Okay. Listen to your papa, boy. Drive off your back foot. Where one foot goes, the other one goes. Got me? Yes. It's a one, two, then counter. One, two, then counter. And don't forget to come back to your position. Stay tight and jab to the center. A man's chin always in the center. Got it? Harry finishes taping up Tony's hand. The two men stand there for a moment. It seems like Tony wants to hug his dad. But Harry turns away from him and calls Kevin over to him. Harry tapes over Kevin's first bandage. I'm going to see what you got now, boy. Now's your time. Harry turns to Tony. Stand up, boy. Get that body warmed up. Keep moving. You want your son to win, don't you? Two men are standing in the ring. That's all I see. Harry reaches back down in the box and moves the tissue paper a bit more. There are a very old pair of boxing gloves. They are very small and don't have much padding. In them. These were the gloves I wore when I was first starting boxing. They're yours now. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Thank you. Harry fits the glove on Kevin's hand and the two men step into the ring. They look at each other from across the ring. Wake up, God damn it! Harry begins to walk around the gym yelling at the posters. Wake up, Jack Johnson, and stand at attention. My son is in the ring. Wake up, Sugar Ray Robinson. You ain't never tasted nothing this sweet. It's a war in here. Fighting Marine. Get your gear! Harry stands in front of Gene Tunney's poster, clicks his heels and salutes him. As Harry is going around waking up the spirits from the posters on the wall, the colors begin to get bright and the stage is no longer washed out. Come on out here, shock boy. It's been, it's new blood in the ring now. Harry stands in front of Jack Shark, Sharky's poster. Harry seems to have so much energy now. The men in the ring are dancing footwork in their corners, rolling their heads around to loosen their necks up. Harry continues to make his way around the room. Wake up, Joe Lewis. Pound on these walls and wake them up. As it Charles, your presence is wanted at ringside. Wake up, Rock from Brockton, Marciano. Meet the new Wills. And he will pound that world championship right out of your vocabulary. Wait up! Harry sees a jet magazine, rolls it, and places it in his back pocket. Harry goes to the back of the room, grabs the half torn photo of Dempsey, and sticks it back on the wall. Gather around. This room is alive. Do you feel it? 
Harry gets in his boxing stance, begins to throw punches and dance fancy footwork. The room is filled with color. Harry is dancing and punching combination, ducking and coming up and connecting with the air. His back foot is spinning off. He looks young again. He is ducking and bopping and weaving. Can you feel it? She's in me. She is in me, feeling my veins. Filling my veins. I'm thinking like a man with a plan. And my heart has no fear. I'm in a split second. I'm in the moment. I have trained and I'm conditioned. I am against ten men in the room. And yet I outmaneuver them all. The two men in the ring move towards each other. They are dancing around. Harry is caught up in his own world. The cheering is getting louder. My darkness held me back. But my boys will, will see a new world. They will fight their way out of this hateful madness. Punch for punch, they will cripple their opponent and finally be free. They will do what I could not. Do not forget who I am. I am Harry Wills. I am the Black Panther. As Harry says his last line, Tony and Kevin each throw a right hook, connecting on one another's jaw and freeze. Harry throws the punch and freezes simultaneously. And as soon as the punches are thrown and the room is very bright and vivid with color, the cheering is super loud. There is a loud grunt, then bump, lights to black, blackout. The end. Featuring Levy Lee Simon as Harry Will, Robbie Williams as Tony Gibson, Yehuda Carter as Kevin Johnson, and yours truly, David Stamps as the narrator, and the amazing Kimberly Gunn as the virtual producer and cyber stage manager. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Congratulations on the show. We now welcome everyone to stay and join the moderated critique session. Please feel free to raise your hand to get on the mic, or you can put comments and feedback in the chat. We appreciate our people offering constructive feedback, and the functions to do that can be found at the bottom of the screen on your toolbar in the reactions section. Love to welcome Lisa McCree and Sabora Rashid and the rest of the cast to the stage. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. So I'll just turn it over to uh, Sabora. Sabora, if you want to. Hi. Well, um, greetings, everybody. First of all, I would like to say how I am so pleased with this wonderful cast. And I know that whoever's watching is in their space at home clapping. I'm clapping. I love what you all did. Thank you. Wonderful. And next, I want to thank Kimberly gun for all of the magic that she did with this sound and the set and uh, I just love what you did thank you very much and then finally last but not least Miss Lisa McCree for her wonderful play thank you thank you so much and, and Lisa did you um, want to say something Yes, the cast. Oh, my goodness. You guys were amazing. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming and supporting. Great. And then we'll uh, open it up to, to the, uh, the cast. And then for folks who are watching, if you want to go on the mic, you can do so by clicking on the reactions button at the bottom of the, the toolbar. And um, you can raise your hand and get on the mic, or please feel free to put your comment in the, the chat. So anyone from the cast, congratulations, great job.
falling. Oh, are we? Oh, are we from the, from the cast? Oh, okay. No, yeah. Um, uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, um, Lisa, this is this was a great, great um story script. Um, and it's very um pertinent. Um, of course, being that it's dealing with you know what it's dealing with. Um. And, you know, I enjoy working with all of you guys, um, Robbie, Sabora, Le Le Levy. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not saying it right, Levy, um, the narrator. Um, great job, everyone. And, um, yeah, I had a blast. Thank you, Sabora and Lisa. I, I would like to just add that um, this is the first time that this cast has ever worked together. I've worked with all of them because I know them all, but they <laughs> did not know each other. So I was really happy to bring them all together. David, Yahuda, Levi Lee, and Robbie. I was really, really happy uh, to bring them together. We're not all, not only not all in the same city, most of us are, but not all in the same state. We're East Coast and West Coast, so this was uh, this was good. I I have uh, questions for the cast and for for um, the playwright. Um, how did you all, as far as the the actors? Um, I, I think people always want to know, people who are not actors always want to know, how do actors prepare for these roles? How do you, what do you do to prepare for these these characters? Oh, what? Oh. Um, what do you, yeah, for people who are not, who are not actors, what do you, how do you prepare um, to play? characters that that um and not you i think yeah. people would like to know um well in in studying the script um it's um it's um looking for just just allowing the characters to talk to you to speak to you and being able to use your imagination to see them and see yourself as them and personalizing, um, personalizing, um, finding a way to personalize and make it personal. Um, it, that, that's a very general explanation. Um, but, um, yeah, that's, that's basically just, you know, when you're going over the lines and at home or when I'm going over the lines at home and just really physically physically going through all the motions that the characters are going through um trying to understand who the character who your character is as a person looking for little things in the script that would indicate what type of person the character is and just you know um just putting yourself in that space um i'm not sure if that's you know, if that answers the question. Um, but, you know, that's a very general explanation, like I said. But, yeah, and of course, you know, going over the lines over and over again. Um, but it's not it's not really it's not really just memorization because um, you're not really memorizing it. Memorizing lines, you're. You're. It, it's like you're taking yourself. Literally as the character through the scene over and over and over and over and over again. Um, yeah. I, I would I'd like to just share thing. just one quick, I'd like to just share a, a comment from Ivy Maria Cross. She said she loves this play, great acting, directing and writing. Would have liked to see some reaction from Kevin with regard to the jet centerfold. There needs to be something feminine that's possible. That's positive in this play. Thank you. Ivy Marie. 
Bobby, what about you? What what is your your um how do you prepare? How do you prepare for a character? Uh, okay, I see you're gonna put me on the spot. Okay. Um <laughs> let's see, what do I do? Uh well, I, I read the script several times over to see kind of like the feeling of it or, or what message I believe is being conveyed in the script. And I think about things that relate to me, um, how how I would feel as if I were in that situation along with the, what I think is a marriage of uh, what the author wants. Um, and then it, the funnest part and the most magical part for me is to work with each individual performer, um, each individual performer and their um, interpretation of whatever they're doing always feeds me. So, you know, if I'm really saying something to someone, I'm trying to really affect them or really change them or really influence them, and they're gonna give me something back, uh, especially with this, this this cast, this wonderful cast, and with the writing, it, it helps me get into where I feel I need to be. But definitely, like Yahuda said, repetition, at least for me, is, is very important because the more I know it, the more I can forget it, and the more I can just be present. Thank you so much. We'd like to just keep putting it out there for any audience members that have any specific comments or questions or um, feedback for the playwright or about the play. Please feel free to raise your hand. You go on the mic. You can also make a comment in the chat like or Q&A. Thank question. you. Did I, did I, is it okay to answer now? Oh please, please, Levy Lee, you're, you 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 were next anyway. <laughs> well, I, I I I don't know. Anyway, um, you know every 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 part different. Uh, so the approach to any particular role will be different depending on the play and the story. And for me, with this particular script. Um, it was kind of easy because I'm I'm a boxing fan, have been a boxing fan all my life. Uh, I even boxed at a very early point in my life um, until a lefty knocked me out. But <laughs> anyway, um, and and also a bit of a, a boxing historian, I did not know much about ha Harry Wills. I, I, that that was surprising to me because I I do pride myself on knowing boxing history and, I, and I, somehow he escaped me so you know I saw a reading of this play I guess last year it was Lisa and um and I had to do some research on who he was you know in, in preparation for this particular reading one of the things that was um was uh paramount was to really get the cadence of the language of Harry Wills as Lisa saw him or heard him and uh, to take that and see how I could just, there's a lot of words, you know, <laughs> and, and, and get his rhythm and cadences and stuff like that. You know, um, that was, that was the work here. Um, and then <clears throat> just, I just should say, you know, I, I, I told Lisa when I first, it's such an important play to me um, because of what it historically, again, what it feeds us educationally. And then also the uh, the symbol, symbolism of it moving forward, you know, so anyway. Thank you. I, I had a question for, for Lisa. This is Kimberly. Um, Lisa, what inspired you to write this play? And pursue this um, this topic. So, <laughs> a, a lot of things when I when I heard about him. Well, how it came into be. Um, I started out with a very different um, version of this play a while back, and I was at uh, Obi Adun's place. He's one of the the um, the last poets, and they were. Uh, it was. They do poetry slams, and on this particular evening, uh, there weren't enough artists there, so the guy sat down and they actually watched a boxing match. And I've never really been into boxing; <laughs> my brothers are, but um, just to sit around and hear the men speak about that, I think that was when my curiosity was sort of peaked. And so I wrote another version, which was done in Santa Cruz, um, and then. Um, 
learning about Harry Wills, um, I actually did this play for a class um, assignment and never really thought about it again until um, Garland called and asked if I had a piece. So it had never been read. And he said he wanted to read it. And I was like, wait, wait, I got to do some rewrites. He was like, well, this is what this is for, Lisa. So I just gave it to him the way that it was. And um, and I'm glad that that he called and I'm glad that I did. So the universe works the way that it's supposed to. But um, so I've been working on developing this piece. So I'm very excited. The, and the actors, they were just uh, they were so amazing. Um, Levy. Yeah. <laughs> you and, and I and I heard and it's funny because you can hear um, when when actors do it, sometimes there are things that you don't hear. And then there are things that they pronounce in the play that you didn't even realize were there. You know, um, Robbie, you know, the, the character, I, I love the way that you played him. There were I, I heard different things and and. The, the choices that you made, I was very satisfied with them. Yehuda, you know, um, I got the raise the roof. Uh, thank you. It was just, I just heard so many different nuances tonight. So thank you. Thank you for that. I'd like to just read a comment from, from Jack. He says, I truly believe the play should be entertaining as well as educational. If the audience comes out a little smarter and more compassionate, we've all done our job. Thank you. So for people out there who've watched, please put your feedback. Give the give Lisa some, some constructive feedback. That's what we're here for. That's how she's going to continue to develop to, her story. Uh, if I can ask Ave uh, Maria a question, the I didn't um, understand the second part of that with the the reaction to the jet, the feminine part. Can you just explain that to me? I don't, I don't know if I truly understand what that meant. If she's able to um, speak. For, for people that want to go on the mic, you can go to the reactions button on the toolbar and raise your hand and we can allow you to go on the mic. Thank you. Um, I, I would just like to say, I, I, I want to give a shout out to David, who did our very exciting narration. Thank um, you very much. He, he kept the narration moving. He did not do it. Sometimes narrators um, try to be very, um, almost monotone sometimes, but this was a very... Um, reactive story and david gave us reactive narration and i want to give him a thank you for that yes thank you okay we have deborah she i'll give you the permission to talk go ahead deborah thank you i moved i moved um to me, it was very realistic. And uh, what struck me, the, the sun coming around, I think after 20-something years, the father, you don't, really don't see that, you know, really. You don't see that, the sun coming around and taking up for the mother, okay, and when to unite with the father, you know, most of the sun will come around and beat the father up. But well, anyway, at the end, you know, at the end, when uh the father said that he knocked the wife's teeth out. And you look at and that's happening. That does happen. When somebody, you know, be with a man that has a violent temper temperature. I mean temper temper. Yeah. It was to me, I said, Wow, that's that's something you really don't you don't really hear about that. You don't see that in the movies or anything like that. And this is so realistic and it's help people to understand about domestic abuse. That's the way I saw it, you know, like that. I like it. I, you know, it was very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. And we have a, a comment from Aaliyah Brown. She says, is this play set to go on stage? Lisa? Uh, that's what we're working on. So um, yesterday uh, we did a... Um, a stage 
a workshop production of it um, in Bridgeport. And it was very important for me to see the movement, um, the flow, um, the transitions. Um, and so there's some things that I know that I need to um, work on with that. Um, and so one of the things that I learned is the choking scene <laughs> is a little long. Um, yeah. Because when you're on stage, I mean, you know, if it were real life, he, the son would be dead. So, you know, there, but see, when you're writing it and you don't see the movement, it's sort of hard to sort of tell because you're trying to get something out. But once you see it, um, it sort of um, gives me the confirmation that, okay, that scene is a little long or it can be directed a little differently in terms of when he kind of lets his son go. But I think, um, so some of those um, monologues can be cut down a little bit, especially in that part because of the anger. But so there were some things that I saw yesterday that were very helpful, but um, overall it went off really well um, in terms of putting movement into it. So that's kind of what I needed to really see. And I was able to see that and um, take some notes to make some adjustments in it. But the next step is, yes, I'd love to get this on the stage, ready for the stage. That we, when we were rehearsing, we also talked about that. The yeah. cast, we talked about the length of that um, dialogue because um, he would have at least passed out <laughs> yeah. if if he wasn't dead. He would have <laughs> because yeah. this is a man who who even though he's old at this point, you know he's he's got boxer's hands and. He was in a rage and in an altered state, and he was choking the hell out of this this young man, his son. He would have been like, <laughs> yeah. And that's why the, the seeing it with movement was important and integral. Because when you're writing it in your mind, you know you see it, but you can't really time out. You know what I'm saying? So it, it was just helpful. So I am um, grateful to have platforms to help me develop it, to work out some of those kinks and stuff that are in it. So very much appreciated. Did, did Ave come back on? Is Ave, was Hi. Ave able to say anything? But, uh, uh, she does have a comment. She said another comment. I remember that men would always turn to the centerfold of Jet Magazine before anything else. Yeah, we talked about that. Um, and, and some, you know, for readings, you have to also choose how many of the directions in the script you want to read and how many you want to to kind of ignore because it's a reading and it can get tedious if you read every single direction. But that was something that we also talked about. He was a young man looking at the jet and what would have inspired him to go buy the jet, right? Because he was supposed to get the Amsterdam news, but which he did, but he also got himself a jet magazine, which back then was 15 cents. And he, what would have inspired him to get it would have been the centerfold. And, and if we were doing this, that would be something he'd be looking at and maybe something that Lisa would include in the dialogue, but he could, you know, we could just, just stage that. Mm -hmm. Like, Ooh, look at that one. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, everyone for, for still being here for folks that are still here, please feel free to go on the mic offer some feedback. What were your thoughts about uh, the characters, plot development? I have, I have a question. Is it, is, is it, is it okay? Of course. I mean, I know, I know there are other people out there and I feel like, you know, I've been talking a lot, so I don't want to, <laughs> um, yeah, I have, I have a, some questions, but there are two that are, are uh, stand out, and uh, one is at the very beginning of the play, and one is at the very end of the play. And I think I'm going to start at the end first, and it has to do with the uh, the fight between Tony and Kevin. And I don't know how 
realistic you are going for here, uh, but it did. I question the fact that um, that Tony. We don't get any indication anywhere else in the script that he's a fighter, and and he's going to step in the ring with someone who is training to be a fighter. And and I did not. I was not totally sold on that unless. You know, we find out, you know, during the story that Tony has been preparing to be a fighter, too, you know, even if it was just to satisfy his father, you know. But as a, as a, as again, you know, coming from the background that I come from, you know, the average everyday, everyday guy cannot step in the ring with a fighter. You cannot. You know, you're not, you're not in shape. You're not trained that way. And you don't have the skills. You know, so I didn't I didn't really they, they they wouldn't even be a fight. You know what I mean? So that's what that was the one. That was one. That's that's from the that's at the end. The second the, I'm going back to the beginning and it kind of is along the same lines. And I think I had this question before, Lisa, when in the very beginning of the play, when. When um, Harry discovers. Kevin in his space, this is somebody he doesn't know. I felt like the stranger entering his space, it, it it seemed like they got they got tight really fast. So they got like, you know, it's like someone broke into me, your home. You don't, you know, five minutes later you're not sitting and talking to them about, you know, life, you know, whatever. You know what I mean? And um and also when when Kevin says that he is there, you know, because he wants to, he's a boxer and he wants him to train him, then what is Kevin's background when it comes to boxing, you know? Has he had fights? Has he, you know, I know he just came up from Mississippi, you know, and he talks about Mudcat knocking Mudcat out, but who else has he fought? Who else, what, what is his, you know, what is his background? You know, that, that would have Harry say, oh, yeah, I believe you. You know, I want to engage you. Otherwise, I, I I had a hard time with that. We have let's see someone who wants to go on the mic. Lisa, did you um, want to oh, respond uh, to that? Are you? Um. Yeah. So I'll take um. I'll take a look at that. So, you know, and here's the thing with, with Tony. Um, he says that in, in the beginning, he wanted to be a boxer. He, he dreamt about it because that's what his dad was. But this fight is not about him being a boxer. This, he, he views Kevin as a young kid. You know what I'm saying? And he believes that his, by the, by the fact of him having his dad's blood in him, that he could take him. It's not about the fight. It's about him proving to his father that he is worthy. So, you know, sometimes emotion can overtake. He feels this is a young 24-year-old kid. And like a 30-year-old would feel like, man, please, I'll put you in your place. It doesn't mean that you got to go out and train for that. He's like, he's more trying to prove something to his father than he is wanting to, you know, uh, his thing is he's a businessman. He's a stationary man. That's what he is. But he feels put upon by this young kid. And there's a little bit of jealousy going on between these two young boys. You know what I'm saying? So they don't always make the right decisions in terms of, uh, you know, and, and when emotions get involved and they want to fight and prove something and be men, you can see that in the street all the time. You know what I mean? So. Um, but I, I, I will take a look at that, but I just don't think that, um, Kevin really, I mean, uh, Tony really needs to have, uh, training to want to fight this boy because Kevin has only been training in the backwoods and Tony doesn't really see that as any formal type of training because the young kid is there asking for, and the most he's ever done is knock some kid out in Mississippi. And that he says that, and he sort of says it in a way 
where he he doesn't even see it as real training because he's like, why don't you go back to Mississippi and shuck some corn or pick some cotton or whatever you do? So he doesn't even see it as legitimate. So he feels like he can take this this kid because he's a kid and sort of earn. And that's why he says to his dad, you don't think I can beat him, do you? So it's not really about uh, Tony having training. It's about him trying to prove something to his father. Um, and in the beginning, we've had this discussion before. We'll look at it. But um, one of the things that um, Kevin does to sort of change the situation is he mentions this man by name and goes up and shakes his hand. And so, you know, he's not, he he's, uh, you know, and, and depending on how he's dressed or whatever, I mean, if he's coming out and he's not looking like a gangster and not looking threatening, he's more wide eyed and doesn't really look like he belongs, you know, and I think uh, um, Harry would have enough sense to to see what a threat is in terms of someone being in his place because he doesn't look like a gangster. And he's, he says him by name, Mr. Wills, I know everything about you. And he shakes his hand. I think you can. T so I don't know if I want to sort of belabor that entrance or make it longer to sort of spell it out. I think it's all in the choices the actor makes in terms of disarming Harry so that he's not seeing him as it's a not, it's not it's not it's not just the fact that he is a stranger in his place it seems that their connection there's a, an emotional connection that happens and it happens really fast and and i i i don't know i'm i'm just like i wondered again never never to rewrite or write but you know, if if they had known each other already and, and the fact that he was just in his space and not expecting him to be there, you know. Well, I think, I too, and I don't mean to interrupt. I think, too, is one of the reasons why the gym is dilapidated and bare like it is, because that's a, that's indicative of Harry's life, number one. And, you know, and I think at this time in his life, it's like, you know, you can meet some people sometimes and because of the space that they're in. They welcome people being in their space. He doesn't see him as a threat, but this gym is indicative of him because it's bare. It's that it's it's empty. This is this man's life. He comes to talk to his posters. You know what I'm saying? So this young kid being in there is sort of to him. He doesn't. He's not seeing this this guy as a threat. Harry can sort of take himself. He's not going to go up against a gun or a brick. But that's not what this young kid has. You know what I'm saying? So. He's hearing him out and his energy. That's why Kevin's energy is so important, you know, in this piece, because when I um, imagined uh, Kevin, I see him as this energetic young kid where he's so charismatic and he's so passionate about what he wants to do. Harry sort of, you know, would feel that and sort of kind of take that on. But. I will take I will take a look at it and see if there's something that I can do to sort of um put up more of a struggle I guess from from Harry or something like that but I'll take a look at it. I just I had a different um mindset and I I really wanted to make that introduction kind of fast bring him in to sort of take it from there. So but I will uh take a look at that. Thank you so much, Libby. Thank you and uh, Deborah would like to make another comment. Go ahead, Deborah. All right. I used, <clears throat> excuse me. I used to counsel on dead women, and when I first started counseling, and I had to meet all of them, and all of them, mostly all of them, was about ten of them had no front teeth, and um, uh, and they, you know, we sat and talked about it, and you know, and they told me that their man, their mate, knocked their teeth out. And I'm saying, wow, you know, that was like really disturbing. And said, yeah, you know, that mother effing knocked my teeth out. And I'm, you know, I'm saying, you could go to the dentist. I said, no, and they didn't want to go. And I don't think, that, I think you go to the dentist, you're on Medicaid, you get teeth, teeth. But they wasn't even thinking about that. They were just talking about how their man and their mate knocked their teeth out. That was the whole 
section about. And, you know, it's really terrible. And then I talked to men, and we said, they did an argument, and I could talk to the men, too, you know, in another section. And they said, you know, don't you want to knock their teeth out? You know, when they want to knock their, their uh, words back down their mouth. And to me, I, you know, I, didn't, I, I couldn't stay with that group. Because it was so, it was like normal for them to get the teeth out, and it was normal for a man to punch the teeth out. I couldn't, and that was in Brooklyn. I, you know, I counsel in Brooklyn. I, I couldn't stay with that group. I had to get out of it, and I went to another group to counsel. Oh, you know, but but it's a it's a really good play, and like I said before, it was about to me. I feel like domestic violence and sort of like revenge a little. That's the way I see it, but I see different things differently. Okay, um, thank you so much for letting me speak. But it was a good play. Thank you, you know, so much, Deborah. Uh, and I think that that's an important thing because yesterday we had a very diverse audience um, at, at the play yesterday. And um, I think there were some people in the audience who, you know, didn't really respond to that part of it positively. I mean, he didn't turn around to knock her teeth out purposely. It was an accident. Um, however, uh, when people of color laugh, it sort of gave other people permission to laugh. So I just, I found that very interesting in the audience because some people laughed and some people didn't. So I guess it all depends on the experience, but it was yeah, I, I didn't want to make it about domestic violence. Um, and this was a man who made a decision because he stayed very jealous of her and she was beautiful that he decided that he had to leave because he didn't want to end up in jail fighting over her. So, yeah. But thank you, Deborah. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone who's uh, made comments and for, for still being here. I think we have one more, one a couple more people that want to say something. Go ahead, please. Jamal. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. This is Garland. Hi, and, Garland. Uh, hey, wanted to uh, first of all say congratulations to you and everyone. Hi, Levy, and to the other actors, uh, and to Sabora. Great job with the reading today. Um, I want to uh, uh, I want to sort of piggyback on, on Levy's question about the beginning with Kevin there. I I myself also felt that it happened a little bit. It happened. It felt like it happened a little fast. But in hearing your response to the question, um, what you articulated, I think kind of maybe what's missing is there's a little more meat that needs to be put on those bones there. So if you could somehow maybe find a way to put into the scene what you articulated to us here in answering that question. If you could put some more of that into into the scene, and, and I'm not sure how, I don't want to tell you how to do it, you know, Kevin should say this, or Harry should do that, or, or whatever, but I believe there's some more meat that you can find to put on those bones that will articulate, that will allow us as the audience members to read what you just articulated for us. So for me, the logic that you're positing is not not off base. Um, I think connections can be established very, very quickly. Uh, you know, I recently had a conversation with someone that I literally met 30 seconds before and the conversation went on for four hours. So, you know, fast connections absolutely can happen. However, in this particular kind of setup, you know, with Harry being who he is and the gym being what it is and it being locked up and all this, I think a little bit more somehow just got to get what you articulated in there. So that's something that's something I was thinking about. And I know this came up in the last time we read this as well. So I know I know you have been looking at it, but I think there's a little more there's a little more food for thought for you there. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and I love those questions. Thank you, Levy, for bringing up those questions. Those are really uh, great, great points. And and I think also in the case of Tony, in the end, if what you articulated can somehow be brought out a little bit more, 
I think in the case of Tony, you've got more opportunity to do that through a, long, a longer uh, time stretch of time because you've got Tony there. You know, Tony is there for a while. You know, so yeah, so you have time to build that in. You don't have to rush it all into one speech or something like that. Yeah. You know? You could, there's opportunity there for you to drop little, little breadcrumbs all along the way. You know? So, and it's little, little things like that, little breadcrumbs, little things like that that connect up to bigger things later on or just in general that help us really, really draw us into the story and go, ah, okay, I get it. Tony's trying to impress his father. That's what it is. He's, and that's why he hasn't left yet because he's... He's acting angry, but he, he re that's not his real motivation. What he really wants is to do this. He wants to get some approval from the father. You know, and I, and I, and I, I think also there maybe could be um, a little different uh, take from Tony on when he hears about when Hen Harry tells him that he sent money from every purse. Every, every fight he did, he sent money home. And he made sure that it was going to take care of him. So he, it's not like he was a deadbeat dad, which is, of course, probably what Tony has been thinking for all these years. So, a couple little observations. Thank you. I think uh, Jamal would like to say something. Go ahead, Jamal. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah, I was having a problem coming on the chat. I guess nobody didn't want me to say nothing. But... Uh, yeah, Lisa, it's a, I like the, it's a great attempt by a woman to write a man, an all man's play, which is really difficult because it's difficult for a man to write an all woman's play. So I commend you on that. I think you did a good job. It, we, I did get a sense of, you know, of anger and, and tension and men want to fight and all that. And you kept it under control. So I like what you did. I mean, I think. As all most plays we know, you have to go back. You learn something from this reading, I'm sure. Go back and look at it, and then you can see how you can refine it even more so that men won't even doubt who it was that wrote it. So, so but anyway, like I said, I think you did a very good job. And, you know, that's the only, that's the only thing I can say what I think about it right now because we can talk privately. But I like what you did. I really do. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you, Garland. And for everyone else that has made comments and for still being here, we have time for an, another comment or two. Feel free to go on the mic or put it in the, the chat or the Q&A. We appreciate the constructive feedback. Right. Hopefully Lisa will be able to draw, draw from that. I have one more question. <laughs> go ahead. Um, so... <coughs> There's this storyline around the fact that uh, Harry he didn't he didn't throw the fight he you know he didn't take a dive but he took the money because Dempsey um, wouldn't fight him and Tony I understand Tony's reaction to that because he's using it it's something that he's using. I get it. What I didn't, what, what, in, it, it, I, I was kind of surprised that Kevin jumped on that bandwagon so quickly. That Kevin was also, once he heard it, heard it, he actually kind of almost turned against Harry for a moment there in the play. And I wasn't sure why. And then I wasn't sure why he turned back. That's it. <laughs> okay. I get Tony. Yeah. I get Tony. Yeah, I do. But I, 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 I wasn't really following Kevin's like reasoning. Especially Yahuda. Yahuda played Kevin. Huh? Uh, I'm I'm asking Yahuda what what does he think about since he embodied Kevin? Um, I think that um that 
I think Kevin had a maybe a certain a certain understanding, a certain understanding of um of ha- of uh Harry Wells that I think left him when he was in the heat of the moment when they were speaking about Dempsey before he choked his son. Um because he did literally pack up everything and left to come up north to be trained by Harry. And he like knows everything about him. You know, he studied him. And um he he was kind of he he has an understanding of him. And the moment when um when he when he grabbed his son, when Harry grabbed his son and choked him. I think Kevin was kind of snapped out of that um, angry place he was in. And I think he probably saw a, I think he got some sort of an understanding of Harry in that moment also when he grabbed his son. And when Harry went through the whole dialogue that he went through while he was choking his son and Kevin, I think looked at him as someone that, is um vulnerable in a way and someone that can um someone in and I mean not not be a teacher or a mentor to him, but in his own way kind of like help him through through some things. Um that's I mean I don't know that's that's my um my take on it. I I think um because I mean you know Levy, you're speaking to the transition about um, when Kevin was angry at Harry and then going from that to act two when they're sitting there and they're speaking as if, you know, um, I understand the question and it's um, I understand what you're getting at. But I think I think Kevin really has a, a great understanding of of, of Harry. Um, and it was just. It, it was. It was just a moment. It was just a moment of um, um. Kevin, Kevin actually looks at Harry as a father figure, you know. And just it's funny thinking about experiences with my father. Um, there's been instances where I've been pissed off at him and angry at him and looked at him a similar way that Kevin looked at Harry. But then also something else happening after which, which was snap me out of it and me realizing what my father actually means to me and the type of person that he actually is. So they, they, I think they have that dynamic. So, um, it's not, you know, to me, it's not really that weird or strange that Kevin would go from calling him a liar and calling him this, that, and the third, and then they go from that to them being in the ring, having a having a um cordial conversation. Because um, Kevin had a monologue where he spoke to Harry about you know what was going on with him and Dempsey, you know. So it it shows it shows an understanding that Kevin has of him, even though it wasn't there because he was angry in, in a particular moment. I, I would defend that too because Kevin Kevin's father died before he was born. And that happened to my own grandson. So to see how that affects a young man who has never had a father to even hug him, or not even to have um a, a photograph, he, you know, to have nothing at all, to only know your father from what other people tell you. The father then becomes, if a father figure then becomes um, like, it's the love that you, that it's like your lost love. It's a sense of abandonment. And I think 
even though the person died, it's not their fault. They didn't abandon you. But that kind of um, uh, uh, not having a father at all, I could see how Kevin would like latch on to Harry Wills. It's in, in his mind, he needs somebody. He's and he says, I know everything about you. I like and and where else would he go? Like that has become his hero. So even though <laughs> Harry says, Harry says to Tony, uh, don't meet your they they say don't meet your hero, but he says that to Tony, but it Kevin, but Kevin, Harry is his hero. And then when he sees, oh, wow, my hero is just a man. But then he has a kind of empathy that I think, I think is valid. I think it's, it's valid. Well, I, I, I'm, I, I'm having a hard time with developing a father-son relationship within a, within a few minutes, a few hours. I'm having a hard time with that. And, and, um, and if that is the case, then would that same person just flip? You know, because he heard, because he heard something and then, well, all of a sudden, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh no, I mean, you know, you carry this with you. Okay. I, I could buy that in his mind. He sees Harry as this, you know, this, this, um, we a role model for, you know, all that, you know, someone he wants to live up to. He's built him up to be this guy. And then someone comes in, another stranger. Who says, oh, he threw a fight. And by the way, it's like he didn't throw the fight. He he actually took the money. And it makes sense that he took the money. It does. Yeah. So, so why would Kevin then just jump on the bandwagon with Tony and then say, hey, he's just this horrible person because he took the money? I, I'm, I'm, it's not because he took the money. It's the idea. And plus, remember, th this character is young. And he's he's like a young wise man. He has a lot of wisdom in the play, but he's also really? very, but when he's he, also very he, young and he's impulsive. He's but, impulsive. But, but when you, he, you said it, he is a smart guy. So and he says he and says, he's impulsive I'm too. He says I'm not that when when he when he breaks down that whole thing about Dempsey, that shows you how his mind works. So he's not a dumb guy. Even though he's from the backwoods of Mississippi, he is he is a he's a mercurial, he's thinking, he's a thinking man. Yeah. So I'm I, so I'm just all I'm saying for me as as a viewer and also as an artist, I'm just confused by that. That's what I'm saying, and that's where it's at. Ke Kevin um Kevin knows that Harry is a genuine person. Um Children, well, Kevin's not a child. He is 24, but just young people, especially children, have have an ability to be able to really see people for who they are. And Kevin really sees Harry for who he is, even though in that moment he got angry. but. Once, once, like the thing about young, young people, well, I mean, people of a certain age, like, you know, teenagers, um, early twenties, like, you know, just, you know, people that might be considered children and young adults, they have an ability to, you know, they, they, once, once they really see you for who you are and they could do it quick. Um, they could do it fast. They, it's like, it doesn't take long. They could, it, it's like, they just, it's, I don't know. They have like a sixth sense for that type of stuff. And when they see you as somebody that they can relate to and they like you and they lock into you, it's like, you know, they could get angry at you like that, but then also too, they're not going to forget that attachment they have to you. It'll just, you know, it'll, it'll, it, I think it, it'll play out the way it did in the play, you know, um, and also me just having experiences working with children, um, of, of, um, grade school age and also like kindergarten and 
elementary age and also junior high school age. You know, I've I've had um, children, kids get mad at me, call me the worst types of things that you like. Okay, um, you know, and then a day or two later, it's like nothing happened. Um, yeah, we've all done that. I mean, I, I, I was a kid once. I, you know, I, I, I had parents who I was always angry with, you know, as I loved them, but I was always pissed off. You know what I'm saying? We all have done that. You know, I, I'm talking about this particular situation with someone you just met. And well, I don't, I don't think um, I don't think Harry really latched on to Kevin really that fast. Um, even though um, Harry could tell that he was just a kid that just wanted to box and learn how to box. Um, Harry did warm up to him, but I don't think it was an instant thing. But Kevin, you know, like Kevin, Harry's his hero. And, you know, he he was looking for a father figure and he's smart and he's young. And, you know, he he just he could just tell that Harry is somebody that he just wanted to be trained by and be around. And that that moment in anger is not he wasn't. You know, he wasn't going to allow that to de deter him to me. I mean, playing him, just, you know, studying him. Um, he, you know, he, he's, he's, I think Kevin's a very forgiving person um, who just, you know, just kind of went off, went off the handle for a moment because, you know, he was upset about something. But you could, you could see it, you could see it towards the end of the play when he's speaking to Tony like, you know, why are you on your father's case so hard? You know, he's, you know, um, he knows he knows the type of guy Harry is. And he knows that everything, that whole exchange, the situation they went through when he when he was angry about him taking a dive or taking the money, you know, he understands why he did nice it. To, it might be nice to hear that or see that. Yeah, I, I could. He he could. Um, um, maybe Kevin could could say could there could be a line where Kevin just said, "Well, you know, like I could understand why a man would take the 50, 50 grand back in the then rather than being on the on the 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 bread line because that would have been during the depression when that happened. I mean, if that you know, I'm gonna but, revisit. I'm gonna revisit that. Um, Thank you, Levy, because, you know, one of the things, too, is, is that I think that um, that can be remedied with a line because with with one line and it doesn't have to be like an entire scene or monologue to right. rem remedy that. But uh, it, it would be something pertaining to Kevin, because if he gives up on Harry, he doesn't have anything. And a lot of times I think people make sacrifices and they deal with things because they have to see the end of what they want. And so if I need to go back and just put a line in there, because when he says, I got to go back, I got to blow for blow, I got to look at it because he's going back. These are all the things that he built up in his head. You got to realize that what he's seeing of Harry is his vision. He's seeing this man. He has he needs a father. He needs someone. He's in this town. This is not his hometown. So it doesn't, like I said, it can be a line or something, but Kevin is afraid of losing it all. It, if he walks away, where is he going? Where Where is he going to go? You understand? He can get mad with, with Harry, but in the end, he still needs something from this man. And it's not just training, but it's the, a father's love, guidance. He has no place to go. He's sleeping in a gym. He's trying to find his woman. So I, I can go back and look at that um, monologue and put something quickly in there to sort of um, have him really examine what it would mean to turn around and walk away, to be so upset or pissed off that you would just be like, okay, well, I'm out of here because you're not what I thought because he's not in the position to make that choice. Yeah. Yeah. This is Garland. Here, I'd like to just jump in real quick and um, just say on, on that point, Lisa, I think that kind of what we're kind of all dealing with here is Kevin could 
I think Kevin could be developed. The character of Kevin could be developed a little bit more. Um, you know, a little bit more about what his motivations are. Again, what you just articulated, if that could somehow come out on the page, because his dad was famous for saying, if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. So um, if we... Somebody could... once said that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think a few people have said that over the years, actually. But, um, but so I think there's an opportunity there to play with Kevin, to take a look at Kevin, the character of Kevin, and... Perhaps he can be fleshed out a little bit more, or just developed a little bit more, uh, because you know, as a viewer, I don't—I actually don't really feel like I know that much about Kevin uh, and his background. I know he's uh, from the backwoods of Mississippi, uh, so he's kind of a country character, sort of, um, and he knows about Harry, um, but I don't know much more about that. And if he does know a lot about Harry, why wouldn't he know? about the whole $50,000 thing, and, and which leads me to the second point, which is I also could, personally, I could use a little more clarity on the whole $50,000 and the whole take it a dive situation. I don't think that's really, at the moment, it's sketched in, but I think you could get a little more detailed with that and give us the actual story, like let Maybe that's letting Harry tell tell the story of exactly what happened, or how how does Tony know about it was this something his mother told him was this in an article was this written about in you know the boxing section of the you know the boxing times or whatever like you know um uh, you know bulletin news story fighter takes dive fifty thousand dollars or how how does how does tony know about that you know and exactly i, I just think that could be clarified a little bit better a, l a little bit more i think we've got an opportunity there to to bring more clarity to, clarity to that, which I think would also help you bring, help bring more clarity to the conflict between that, that Tony feels about it, because Tony makes a big deal about it. I mean, he really harps on that a lot. So clearly that bugs him, but maybe he only knows this, you know, the story that was written in the newspaper. He doesn't know the real story, right? And, and also this is a human <coughs> Harry has been fighting for a long, long time. And so how does Harry feel about that? And was it simply a buyout of his contract that was somehow portrayed, you know, to the rest of the world as in a negative light? You know what I'm saying? Because Harry does talk about the contract that they had signed, that they, yeah, no, they had actually signed a contract. They were going to fight, but other forces didn't want that to happen, so they dragged it out, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I, for me as a viewer, I think we could have a little more clarity in those areas. I think that would be a real help in general. Yeah, hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So in the in the beginning, um, uh, Harry does blame uh, Jack Dempsey, uh, and that's the story that he has lived with. In but in the in, it does state when he says that uh, Rickard Rickard. Uh, was the the boxing commissioner, um, and he tells that story of how they outpriced the tickets and stuff. There's a change in the story, and Harry Will says, "I can't fight the whole world. There's only room for one man in the ring, which was Jack Dempsey." So he said it, but he he can't fight the whole world or the boxing community because you can't bring all of them into the ring as a man who's trained to get into the ring with one other person, he can only look at Jack Dempsey. When the young kid says, I read the paper, this is what you said. He says, no, that's what they said. This is what really happened. He says that. So if it needs to be clear, I can put it in there again or just try to make it. But it does state in there because he says, the son, Tony says, well, why don't you blame the man who's responsible? And he's like, how do you fight the whole world? You, you understand? How do you fight the boxing? Well, so I, I'll make it more. He, well, he, well, yeah, well, he yeah. did explain well, it. He did it. You know, I, I think it. I think it's there. I, I really. I, it's, I, there. I, it's, it's there. It's it's there. My 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 question around that same thing, because at first when I read the whole thing about R Ricard, it seemed like it came 
out of the blue. But then when um with the with when you explain the bigger picture, when you explain that it wasn't just about Dempsey, you know, Dempsey became this kind of figurehead for the entire world. He couldn't fight the entire world, this racist world with Ricard and the boxing commission and all that. That was just too much, right? I get all that. I get all that. I I and then he's paid this money, you know, to kind of as a consolation, as you have in your script. And and I and I get that part too. What I didn't get was why that was seen as something bad. I think that's exactly I think that's exactly right. And I think that's actually a more boiled down version of what I was kind of getting at because you're right. It is, it is there. It is there. And I'm thinking maybe it's, maybe it's just that point which you articulated. Maybe it's just kind of how it came out. So yeah, they're not seeing it as bad. They're going on the, on the story of what Harry told first in terms of taking the purse. So when he explains it, there is no longer that, uh, that question, but I'll relook at it. I'll I'll relook at it. So if it's not clear, I will um work to make that clear. But um Harry is the one who's holding on because he said it was a consolation, an unearned purse. He would and then he when he speaks to Jack Dempsey, he's saying, How did you know? How did you not want to fight? Regardless to whether he got the fifty thousand dollars, he wanted to f- prove his worth. Yeah. That's all good, though. That's all good. Okay. Yeah, he wanted to prove it. So, you know, the the boys are more reacting to the real story now and not the, you know, the 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 pinpoint or the target of Jack Dempsey being it. It's the whole because this was set up by white America and the boxing industry. This is what it was. So they had to um you know, they picked and choose who they wanted to be on top and who you know, they didn't want to be embarrassed and there would have been a riot. So I will make that more. I will go back through it and make it more clear as this is what happened in the trans in transition. Yeah. I, 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 I'd, I'd like to just add that part of it. I, I think if if you did give Kevin a, a line and it could just be a single line about the money, like him understanding the the money. Um, that would also be a contrast with Tony because Tony is using this as a, as a cudgel against his father. He's he's using it because his whole issue is um, you you weren't there for me. And that's his whole issue. So what can he? What can he glom on to? It's that, oh, yeah, you're such a big hero. You're such a big hero. But look what you did. Look what you did. You're not a hero. You're not a hero, which is what young people do. They do that. They That age, teenagers to their 20s. And in his case, he's 30. But he's, he's, he's more like a 30-year-old in the 21st century than maybe 1950s. Kevin is the only one, yeah, because Kevin is the only one who thinks Wills is a hero. Wills does not. Yeah, but I'm talking, uh, yeah, I know, but Tony, but but Tony, Tony is challenging, yeah, but I mean, the idea, he says his mother always told him about his father, but so she she obviously played him up, even though she said, no, you go to school. Don't, you know, don't be like your father. Don't be a boxer. You go to school. But yet and still, she was telling him about, about his father. And he says, yeah, I, I, when I was a kid, like I wanted to, um, to box and then, uh, come in and, and fight you. And I win over you and then tell you I'm your son. So he always had this, like, yeah, this, your, the world sees you one way, but I see you some in a different way. So it's kind of that challenge and it's the pushback, the pushback that young people do to their parents. The other thing is, you know, uh, and I buy totally that Tony is like, he's going to use whatever he can 
to like dig at his dad, you know, because he wants the attention uh, ultimately and all that. But he's angry. He's got all this history. He's coming in there and he's going to use this, you know. And I wonder what would happen if instead of Kevin jumping on the bandwagon that he comes to Harry's defense, what would happen if those two went at it earlier, Kevin and Tony? What would you discover? You know, and that would probably help you flesh Kevin's character out a little bit more, too. It's just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much for, for participating in this uh, vibrant conversation. <laughs> it was great. It was great to, great to hear that. And any final comments before we, we head out? No, but I just wanted to say thank you, everyone. Job well done. Thank you for um, giving me some things to look at in terms of furthering developing the script. I really appreciate it. Great job. Great job. Yeah. Great. Love it. Thank you so much. Great job, Lisa. Great job to the cast and everyone. Sabora, thank you for coming on board as director and doing a wonderful job. The entire thank cast, you. everything came together beautifully. Thank you so much. And thank you again, everyone, for the to all of our people who um, were in the audience and uh, to those who, who contributed to the conversation. This is all about, once again, all about helping the playwright develop their work. And Lisa is a longtime member of the Frank Silvera Writers Workshop family, and so we're doing all we can to help her develop, develop her work. So thank you, everyone. Okay. Great. Thank you. See you next right. time. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Good night. Good night.